It seems that alongside exciting points updates, Games Workshop has also dropped a document that clarifies a huge amount of things from the core rules that were entirely missing before. Let's talk about fly and terrain, minus one damage negating small arms or not doing so, interactions with stacking sustained hits, and redeploying units with teleports and battle shock. Quite a lot to talk about for how Warhammer 40 gay games are supposed to be played. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where Games Workshop's certainly been dropping a whole load of content on us over the last week or so. All the indexes for just about every army in the game, now a whole bunch of points costs, and now basically really quite a lot of clarifications and updates to the core rules in a document that they've called the Rules Commentary. I must admit this document looks like really quite a good one, really clears up a whole load of questions that people had about the game of Warhammer 40k and how it was played. There were a fair few things that just needed addressing as per the core rules. It is maybe a little bit weird that they've decided to call this a rules commentary as opposed to an FAQ or errata type document. I don't really think that it entirely counts as being a commentary really, seeing as it actually makes a fair few actual core changes to the way that certain rules work. And there are quite a few things here that probably should have just been flat out in the core rules in the first place. The document really is a pretty dense and fairly intense one, 18 pages worth of tiny scripts and double columns. Admittedly very nicely set out though, and really quite easy to reference. And perhaps the most important part is that there's big answers to really quite a lot of questions, hidden amongst a whole load of definitions to things that are kind of basic or obvious. The document basically feels like the rare rules section of the 9th edition rules, or the rules appendix for I think 8th edition before that. A big collection of rules that maybe don't come up all that often, and basically have a core way of deciding the result of certain important interactions between units, perhaps particularly focusing on things off datasheets, but there are things from the core rules as well. In terms of actual interesting content of this, there's a big change to minus 1 damage abilities, changes to fly, redeployed units and battle shock, and just a few helpful clarifications for things like big guns never tire, and interactions with terrain, which a few people were wondering whether or not they'd intended one way or the other. Jumping right into it, let's start with the minus 1 damage thing. This is a rule that was really quite common in 8th edition, though it's a bit more rare in 9th. There are a few places where it crops up, things like Redemptor Dreadnought still have it, you can have it for a couple of 2 command point stratagems on Guard or Death Guard, and other things like the Tyrann effects and the Storm Raven just have it built in in 8th. The change for these rules between 9th edition and 10th though, was that usually it was listed to minus 1 damage to a minimum of 1, and that rider was gone from the 10th edition rules. Initially in the core rules, there was literally nothing that stopped you reducing a weapon's damage characteristic to zero, and it just meant that these units would be 100% immune to certain small arms, something that Warhammer 40k doesn't generally tend to allow by game design. I did think it was kind of unlikely to be intentional, just about nothing else in the game gives you 100% immunity against a unit's full attacks, and it does indeed seem that it wasn't. Basically the change for this one just comes from their modifiers rule, clarifying that it can't be reduced less than 1, Pretty decent to know, seeing as it's really quite a big deal for those units and the units trying to kill them. It does seem like something that should probably have been in the core rules though, or maybe could do with just editing that digital document to put it in. I feel like it probably was just absent by an error. It had been quite tight on a bunch of other things, such as modifiers to hit rolls and wound rolls and things, just the damage things seem to have slipped through. More in the line of a helpful clarification is they do confirm that Big Guns Never Tire does indeed work the way that most people seem to think it does. A fair few people are sort of arguing that it wouldn't allow vehicles to fire out from combat, just due to the rule being kind of awkwardly worded and a little bit ambiguous as to what sort of subject they're referring to when they were talking about the rule. I personally did think it checked out rules as written, so I don't think that this really is a rules change, but basically with this diagram they confirm that yes, the vehicle in combat can indeed fire at the unit out of combat, but it would take the minus one to hit penalty if it did so. There was an interesting little one about Deep Strike and Strategic Reserves. Seems to have taken people quite a lot to understand that they're two different things in 10th edition, as they were in 9th. They are entirely separate, your unit can be in Strategic Reserve, it can be in Deep Strike, though it's kind of interesting that they do interact and kind of stack, and it says that if a unit with Deep Strike ability arrives from Strategic Reserves, the controlling player can choose to use the Deep Strike ability to deploy it. I think that will be relevant for a few units in 40k, some of them can basically disappear off the board and go back into strategic reserve. It is kind of interesting that they can return to the board via deep strike after that. So anything that has deep strike that also has one of those disappearance type rules, that just became a bit more powerful with the addition of this. There's quite a big clarification to sustained hits, which basically means that multiple copies of sustained hits don't stack. 
That was really quite a common question, as you'd often have weapons that had sustained hits on their core profile, like heavy bolters, and then be under some sort of rules buff that also gave them sustained hits 1. I think just by the core rules, I don't think there was actually anything that prevented them from getting the double sustained hits on one unit. There were kind of two separate rules that didn't really interact with each other, but as per this rule, it does say that you can't get multiple copies of them on the same target. The unit that has the sustained hits rule just uses the most powerful one, and they don't use both. It does mean that certain buffs and things will be a bit less effective on things like heavy bolters that already have them. I'm not sure this was a change that was necessarily needed, to be honest. It seemed like a rule that could quite happily stack multiple times, and it wouldn't be particularly broken or overpowered. They also do have the clarification here that sustained hits do not trigger lethal hits. Quite a few armies might be able to get both. This seems like it had a good precedent from 9th edition, but good to have it spelled out so people aren't misunderstanding. If you've got a sustained hit, then the extra hit that you get it doesn't count as a lethal one. Next up, there's a couple of rules for particularly enormous models trying to arrive onto the board. There's one that says that for really big models arriving from strategic reserve, then they basically have to spend a turn arriving onto the board. If they can't fit physically within the 6 inches on the board edge, then they basically can't do anything for a turn. They do say it's okay for aircraft to have their wings overlapping beyond the deployment zone, provided the base is in there though. There's also one that I think is relevant to Gasgol Thracker, which is called Disembarking Large Models. Gasgol's not able to set up wholly within 3 inches of a transport that he gets out of. He can go in certain transports like the Battle Wagon and the Stomper, but basically if he decided to try and disembark, then he wouldn't actually be able to, due to not being able to fit wholly within the 3 inches. Apparently if that's the case though, you just set them somewhere with their base within 1 inches of the transport, and then you're good to go. I guess theoretically that means that Gasgol could actually gain a little bit more movement by setting up towards the front of the transport, and then his extra base protrudes a little bit further towards the enemy, might just make a very very slightly shorter charge. Next up, here's a clarification to fly that should absolutely have been in the core rules. I think it is how most people were expecting it to be played, but basically just confirming that if you have to go up and over a piece of terrain, you do measure diagonally up, across any distance horizontally you might need to go, and then diagonally down again, which did seem the way that it likely was intended, judging by the diagonal movement when you're moving up and down terrain. Without this rule, terrain pieces could be a big issue for certain units with fly. It meant that they could jump up to the top of them, but they couldn't technically go up and over without this, even if the units did have the movement to do so. It's perhaps a bit less relevant for fly infantry models that will often be just ghosting through ruined walls, though they wouldn't be able to do so with armoured containers like these, and it does kind of underline the big nerf that fly has had this edition. It means that big monsters and things with fly need to measure up and over terrain like ruined walls if they want to go over it. Realistically, that means that a lot of the time they just need to go round, and if they choose to go over, that's going to cost a whole bunch of movement distance, so they'll be going very slowly if they choose to. Just for another extra little clarification for rare scenarios, if you have to move over uneven terrain, then apparently you need to move the fly model high enough so their base can fit horizontally through that gap. I think that's best shown by perhaps the diagram with the Inceptor in the middle there. He needs to fit his base horizontally between the two crates. There's a couple of small things for transport. Embarked units in a transport don't count as being on the battlefield for any rules purpose. It means that you can't use stratagems on them, and that is kind of similar to how it was in 9th. They also can't use their unit abilities as well. I feel like that's often kind of covered with the firing deck rules though. If they can fire weapons outside of the transport, the weapons count as being equipped by the transport and not by the units. They also clarify what the vehicle's hull means here as well. For models that don't have a base, the word hull counts as literally any part of the model basically, even if you might not classically consider it as being part of the hull. That one is pretty relevant for things like, say, Drukhari transports with all their great big spiky bits out the front. Another thing that's definitely a rules change that will absolutely be relevant to armies like Grey Knights is that apparently you can't be teleporting around to hide from Battle Shock. When people saw the Grey Knight faction ability, they thought it might be a good excuse to basically teleport off the board at the end of the opponent's turn, avoid the Battle Shock step, and then turn up in your own reinforcement phase, avoiding the check even if you happen to have a depleted unit. The biggest change to this, to make sure Battle Shock's relevant even for them, is that if the repositioned unit is below half strength and was not on the battlefield during the command phase, it must take a battle shock test as if it were your command phase after it's been set back up. That's definitely not enormously intuitive and was not in the core rules before. I think it does make sense though, if you're being suppressed by a whole bunch of casualties, then spending a bit of time teleporting through the warp probably isn't going to settle you any better. Otherwise they do clarify that ongoing effects like stratagems and things might still well affect this unit even if they've been repositioned. 
and these repositioned teleporting type units still do trigger things that count as reserves, say for example anything that might allow you to shoot reserves as they come on. Next up, they've done a little diagram to clarify exactly what can and can't shoot when you're moving models in and around ruins. That has been quite an important change from 9th edition that maybe wasn't enormously obvious to a lot of people the first time they read through the rules. But basically, if you can get within a ruin, but not wholly within a ruin, you're in the awkward spot where your model can be shot, but not shoot through the ruin themselves. Here's perhaps the normal state of affairs for units trying to hide behind ruins. This repulsor tank can light up the termagants that are hiding within the ruin as it's got a line of sight to them, but technically can't fire at the one that's the other side of the ruin, as essentially the ruin's counters obscuring his line of sight, even if they don't physically do so on the board. The change in 10th edition is that if this tank can get partially within the ruin, in 9th edition you would have been able to see through it and shoot the termagant squad at A. Now that's no longer the case, the model has to be entirely within the footprint of the ruin if it wants to see through to the other side, or I guess it needs to actually put part of its model physically through the other side of the ruin, even if it was just a jutting out bit at the front of the model. It is a bit weird this one, as it basically means that the repulsor tank won't be able to shoot at the termagants, but the termagants will be able to shoot at it. Basically it means that it's not usually going to be a good idea to just put part of your model in cover, but not all of it, at least in terms of a line of sight perspective. If the model can get itself wholly within the terrain piece though, then it will be able to fire out again. It now can see through those ruined walls, so it can light up the termagants at A should it want to. As a little tangent, they also clarify what's meant by within or wholly within on a whole squad basis. Generally line of sight is done on a model by model thing, so it's not quite as relevant for that, but sometimes it might be important whether a unit's wholly within or not wholly within terrain. Probably the most interesting thing about this is that the termagants at C don't count as wholly within the terrain. Having all the models just tow into it isn't quite enough. You need to literally have every single model wholly within the terrain for the whole unit to count as wholly within. So even one gaunt having part of his base out will break that. They have put a clarification for when rules like Necron Reanimation Protocols are used as well. They've got a statement saying rules used at the end of the command phase, and basically just doubly underlining that yes, they do indeed mean the end of the command phase, which to be honest I wouldn't have interpreted any other way, but due to a rule in the command section of the command phase saying that other rules within the command phase happen now, some people interpreted that as reanimation protocols happen before Battleshock. That did seem very unlikely to me, the rule very clearly specifies when it happens, and in general I feel like specific rules tend to trump general ones. As there might have been a little bit of a conflict though, kind of handy to have it clarified, even if I think that it rules as written works this way before. Otherwise, it still looks like that attacker's priority rule is making the jump from 9th edition to 10th. This one's just a rule to iron out a few niche conflicts. Some exotic rules might say that you can only hit this unit on a 6+, or you always wound the enemy on a 2+, say with the anti-rule. And in any of those cases, it just means that the attacker's rule trumps the other one. So say if you had a rule that meant you could only be hit on a 6+, and a rule that meant that you're always hit on a 3+, the rule hitting on the 3 plus would take precedence. It also means that the anti rule would beat, say, transhuman physiology if it existed in 10th edition, and certainly beats the minus 1 to wound rule. Finally, there's a clarification to out of phase rules, which again is basically the same as it was in 9th, just saying that, say, certain rules that specify that they need to be used in the shooting phase still need to be, even if you get to do an out of phase shooting attack, the most common likely being Overwatch. It means that, say, Space Marine Suppressors, who've got a rule that, say, in your shooting phase, you get to debuff one enemy unit with a minus one to hit. That one wouldn't be applying in Overwatch, but you would still be able to use non specified rules that impact ranged attacks. Say, for example, if you had reroll ones to hit from somewhere, unless that rule literally said that you only get reroll ones to hit in the shooting phase only, you'd still be good to go with that. There is a massive amount more content in the document than that, I will link it down in the video description below. I'd say that the vast majority of it was either kind of obvious, or just putting some watertight definitions in place to try and stop people abusing rules in any way, but I think it's definitely good that the document exists, definitely answers a whole bunch of questions that people have had, it does kind of feel sort of like the core rules FAQ for 10th edition, even if they might have had a bunch of this already prepared in advance. Let me know what you make of these rules changes anyway, and if there's anything else interesting in the document, feel free to let me know. There are a whole bunch of other rules there, some of which might be obvious to a lot of people, or might be less so to others. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, where I'll certainly keep up the regular 40k videos, I do tend to post new ones just about every day.
Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and that's the main reason I can dedicate quite so much time and effort to making videos like this, and if you're enjoying, any support is enormously appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.